Hello, River of Life Church, and welcome to week four of the Alpha Journey. And what an amazing adventure it has been thus far. In the past, we have looked at who is Jesus, why did Jesus die, and how can I grow my faith? And as we continue, we have just been so amazed with the feedback that we've received from all our Alpha small groups, how people are growing in relationship together, how the discussions and participations have gone, and just how God is building a community around us. And we know there's still more to come. And as we learned from last week's session, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 says, now faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. As we reflect on the community and the life in our small groups, we're just gonna take a short detour as we put our spotlights on a man who has carried a vision for so many years of transforming individuals, communities, and nations through faithful and productive use of land. Shall we cut across to hear more from that? Well, it's wonderful to have Brian Audrey with us this morning, the founder for Foundations for Farming. And Brian and Keith are such a special couple and family to uh, River of Life, and they have attended River of Life Eastly for so many years. And it's such an honor and a privilege to have you this morning, Brian. Mm -hmm. So Brian, welcome, and thank, thank you, you for joining us this morning. Thank you so much for having me. So Brian, you have carried a prophetic vision for over 40 years. What is that prophetic vision? Well, God prepares you all your life, you know. Uh, when I left school, I went tobacco farming, and I did that for nearly 20 years. Then Kath and I became Christians in 1978 and then God started to work on us and it, very at the beginning of this time of growing food, God gave us Isaiah 58, which is all about sharing God's vision through his people. And it's very important that he uses us as, as his people, but also the priority of his heart is for the poor. And, um, you know, it's so important that there's so many promises in Isaiah 58 to result in the rebuilding of a nation. And here we are in a nation that is hurting very much. And I believe the heart for the poor gives us uh, the attitude of Christ Jesus, his unselfishness, which is very important for us to express, and his humility and faithfulness. And that's what we teach, it's the humility and unselfishness and faithfulness of Christ Jesus. And it spreads from us in our church, we pray, to the whole nation and beyond. That's brilliant, Brian. Um, and that vision, Brian, that you have carried over the years, how has it outworked locally in Zimbabwe? Yeah, we, we've shared it onwards because God said it was sheer vision and knowledge I've given you. All right. So that's what I've done as best I can. But now in, in, it's been uh, teaching the church and, and sharing with the church. And then the, it, it, God involved me with a parent she when I shared the gospel with him in 1997. And then he called us into what's happening now, which is the Form Foods program, right. which is a way to grow um, food on a very small piece of land, one sixteenth of a hectare, and they're doing two that can feed the family and another family, which covers the whole nation. And we've been called to reach two million households, which is over seven million people, half the population. Right. Wow! And so that's amazing vision. And then I've been put on the Arda board also through my friendship with uh, um, Minister Perrin Shiri. And um, so I sit on that now, and we, my, my dream is, and they agree with me fortunately, right. is that there are 28 stations throughout Zimbabwe to put a station on each one of those to right. share the gospel in the, the heart of Jesus and the way to bring people out of poverty in our nation. Wow. Yeah. What an amazing story, mm -hmm. Brian. And not only has um, the Foundation for Farming has been embraced in, in, in yeah. Zimbabwe, but it has also been taken outside of Zimbabwe yeah. uh, internationally. How is that going as well? Yeah, it's amazing. It's in five stages. Firstly, to teach the poor where they are. Right. Then have hope for the nation, which we're doing now. Hope for your continent. And then he got, took us into the world. Mm. And that's the fourth stage. And basically, we've gone into the world because the poverty in the world is different to us here in Africa and broadly speaking there, there's materialism and consumerism Right. and many people can't make the expectations on society at the moment of what is with it, you know. And there's anxiety and then there's depression, there's nervous breakdowns and yes. then there's um, 
suicides, you know, and then there's alcohol abuse and, al and um, drug abuse. And so this is growing worse and worse. And we come along and this world doesn't deal with it properly because mm. they just give them Prozac and give them things, but it doesn't help their hope and their self-worth. And we discovered on Lord Goring's farm, who he gave us five hectares near Brighton, near Worthing. And we shared their how to, to grow for the broken ones, the broken right. ones of this world. And they grow a beautiful bed of vegetables, so straight and beautiful. And then they do it in community together. They become, they feel self-worth. And in that time, we shared the gospel with them too. Wow. And so we, that's spreading throughout all five continents now. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. Well done, Brian. And I think that vision that you have mm -hmm. carried, we see how it's outworking not only in communities, but in nations now, and yeah. it has been well embraced. And Brian, at this particular time, I'd really love you to pray for us, to pray for the church, um, so that we can rally behind this, yeah. this vision yeah. and really uh, embrace what God has yeah. taught through you and through this vision. Yeah. Would you pray for us as a church yeah. and to give us a charge um, as a nation as well? With pleasure, Mush. Yes. Oh, thank you, Father, for your presence with us. Yes, Lord. And Father, I just thank you for River of Life. And I thank you for this Alpha course, Lord God, mm. that is centering us on Jesus and his love for us and love for others. And the centrality of Jesus is so important. And I thank you for this church thank that you. has always put that. And I thank you for my friendship with Scott over the years, Lord yes, God, Lord. to see that where one church should preach the gospel and the fullness of Jesus Christ and his word in truth. So Father, I just ask you to bless River of Life. And Father, I thank you that you've given us a tool to reach the poor. And it's always been a, an amazing heart of River of Life, Lord God, for so many years. And Father, may we increase that and may it become our priority, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Because Jesus, when you announced you came, you said, I've, preached, I've come to preach the good news to the poor. When you sent mm. the church into the world in Galatians 2.10, you said, do not forget the poor, the beginning of the church age, Father. And then, Lord God, the most important and what I really pray for and for understanding prophetically in this church, that the final one, Lord God, is that when Jesus had finished his ministry and there he was and his disciples asked him what would happen at the end. And he goes through what's going to happen at the end before Jesus comes back. Thank you, Lord. At the very end in Matthew 25, he said that, you are a sheep or a goat, depending on whether you have responded to the poor. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was without shelter and you took me in. I was in prison and you came and saw me and I was sick and you helped me. Thank you. Father, I pray that we'll prioritize your heart for the poor because we must be ready to face Jesus on that great day. Everything in scripture points to that great day mm. when we'll answer to you and the heart of the poor is the criterion as whether we come and live with you forever or depart from you forever. So I thank you for the heart for the poor and the of life, Lord God. May we walk the prophetic line, the difficult line, Father, and face the truth for your glory. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brian, mm. for praying for us. Yes. And we would like to pray the same for you Mm. and Kath and uh, the Foundation for Farming team and all the Thank work you. that you, are, you guys are doing. You are Thank carrying you. an amazing vision that will bring transformation, not only in Zimbabwe, but across the continents. Thank and you. we pray that this vision would continue to grow and to explode in the hearts mm. of people. Oh, and we are just so chuffed for what Thank God you. is doing through you. You are a blessing to us and to the nations. Thank and we can celebrate and say, let the nations be glad Amen. because God is doing an amazing work through Amen. us. Thank you so much, Brian. It was Please amazing see. having you here. No, it's been wonderful to be yeah. with you. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, it's brilliant to hear from Brian and what God is doing through Foundations for Farming. And we've just seen how God has used Foundations for Farming to cut across nations and to bring transformation across the globe. And I just love being a part of a church that has embraced and invested itself in God's vision and promise. And as we continue to look at community and what's happening in River of Life and even beyond, next week we have Dr. Dumi and Tokozo Ndlovu who are going to give us an update on COVID and some of the vaccines options available to us. And right now we're going to cut across to our alpha session, why and how do I pray? 
I trust that you're going to have a blessed time together in your small groups and have wonderful discussions. And we look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you. Growing up, I was a reluctant prayer, despite being surrounded by prayer. At school, we had prayers in assembly, which everyone recited off by heart. But to be honest, most of the time, none of us had a clue what we were praying about. At home, my family prayed for everything. Lost pieces of Lego, parking spaces, meal times, except for some reason, breakfast. I never really knew why. I just thought maybe God wasn't an early riser. The only time I used to choose to pray was when I was in trouble or when I needed help. Prayer is one of the most universal instincts. Most people at some point in their lives pray. Yeah, and Jesus, when he talks to his disciples, says when you pray, not if you pray. So he kind of assumes that everyone will pray. And if you think about it, if God exists and created us for relationship with him, then talking to him is the most natural thing in the world. Yeah, and all our relationships are based on communication. When people learn how to communicate well, then their relationships grow and flourish. Every day. Twice a week? Yes, a lot. <laughs> no, I don't. I used to, but not so much now though, because I, I kind of like, I have a lot of what I want now. Honestly? Well, not really, to be honest with you. Not really. I don't really pray. I sort of just meditate on things. In my own way, yeah. Well, oh, I guess only if I'm really, really scared, or that I really, really want something, then I'll pray. <laughs> For help? and to talk with God. Hope for things. I wouldn't say I pray to anything specifically. I pray every day. I pray, I pray even when like things going good or like things going bad. I still pray even though I question a lot of it and doubt a lot of it, but I still find myself praying kind of often. Before I was a Christian, I can remember one time. It was in my gap year between school and university. I was 17 years of age, and I was traveling around the United States on a Greyhound bus with a, a Rover ticket. And I lost all my luggage. It was stolen. My rucksack was stolen with all my clothes and my money. All I was left with was my passport and my Greyhound bus ticket. I went and spent 10 days living on a hippie colony in Key West, and then I started to travel 500 miles every night. I used the Greyhound bus as my hotel. I'd get on at night and sleep 10 hours, wake up 500 miles away in another city, and spend all day walking around that city on my own. And I was so lonely. And eventually, although I was an atheist, I prayed that I would meet someone that I knew. And the following morning, I got on a bus in a remote place in Phoenix, Arizona, and I saw someone I knew, an old friend from school called Andy. And I just said, I don't believe it. Andy's still a friend of mine, and whenever he sees me, he goes, I don't believe it. <laughs> he lent me some money, and apparently I spent it all on socks. <laughs> I didn't really make anything of that. I just put it down to a coincidence. But in the last 40 years, Prayer has become the number one priority in my life. Not that I'm an expert in it. I still find prayer pretty difficult. When I start to pray, all these distracting thoughts, my mind wanders all over, over the place. And often, just in the busyness of life, I find it really hard to find time to pray. But I love praying. Why is that? Well, prayer is the most important activity of your life. In fact, it's the very purpose for which you were created, because you were created for a relationship with God. And how do you communicate in this relationship? By prayer. And if you love someone, you want to spend time with them, you want to communicate with them, you want to grow in that relationship. And that's how we grow in our relationship with God.
the Apostle Paul wrote, through him, that is Jesus, we both, that's Jews and Gentiles, that's the whole known world at that time, have access to the Father by one Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. So Christian prayer is to the Father. Before I was a Christian, I, if I thought of God, I thought of a kind of autocratic judge or a cosmic policeman who was out to get me. Sometimes people say to me, I don't believe in God. And when they describe God, that's the kind of God they're saying they don't believe in. Well, I don't believe in that kind of God either. I believe in the God who Jesus described when he said that we were to pray, Our Father in heaven. Jesus taught us to address God, and he actually taught us to use an Aramaic word, Abba, which is still used by children today in the Middle East. Daddy, Papa. It's a, the most intimate word that you can use to a father. And Christian prayer is like that. It's to the father who loves you. My mum had MS, so she was really ill when I was growing up. I didn't really know life without her having MS. But besides that, my parents were like the best to me. They, were, they would do anything for me. But I wasn't the best kid. I am now, like now I'm the best. But uh, before, when I was a teenager, I, I would just lie and I would be rubbish in school. I wouldn't be like the violent kid or it wouldn't be like obvious. Like some kids get into gangs and selling drugs. I, I was like way too smart. Like I just like causing trouble that you couldn't get caught for. And over a period of time, I started to realize how you could steal without getting caught. One day coming back from the, the cinema, I remember walking through the door and my parents were sat at the dinner table and was like, Alex, we need to talk to you. And basically what happened is like, I just stole the money from their bank account and they found out. And so I ran upstairs into my room. I just remember feeling like I hate myself not even like who had I become. Not, it wasn't like that sort of moment. It was more, I'm rubbish. Like, I'm just a bad kid. And so I piled my entire room against my door. Like I got my bed, my drawers on my bed, everything, and then piled it up and then just sat at the other end of this barricade. It was silent for a bit and I, I was crying and I just, my dad comes up the stairs. He knocks on the door and I just don't say anything. And then he stops and he's like, okay, I'm gonna go. But he said this thing, which I'll never forget exactly what he said. He said, I need you to know that me and your mum love you. We're just confused because we don't know what we haven't done for you. And then he, he just said, I'd love it if you opened the door because I really want to give you a hug right now. And then like a few years later, I don't know what I was thinking about, but I was just thinking about that moment. I realized like that's the, like one of the most real examples of who God is that I've ever seen in my life. Just, just sort of that begging to come and show mercy. My dad's just the best. Jesus tells us to pray to our Father in heaven. This loving Father is also the creator of the entire cosmos. The universe is vast. The sun, which is 93 million miles away from our Earth, is so large that 960,000 Earths could fit inside it. Did you know that the sun is one of 300 billion stars in our galaxy? Our galaxy is one of 100 billion galaxies. For every grain of sand on the Earth's beaches, there are a million stars. In a throwaway line in the book of Genesis, the writer says, he made the stars also, just like that, the whole universe. We pray to the creator of the universe. He's transcendent, outside of time, yet at the same time, he's imminent. Prayer is to the Father, the creator and sustainer of everything, but it's also through the Son. Through Jesus' death on the cross, the partition, the barrier of sin has been removed and we have access to God. It's through Jesus the Son that we have access to God the Father. A young soldier fighting for the Union Army in the American Civil War lost both his father and his brother in the fighting. 
He needed to return to his family's home and help his sister and elderly mother with the spring planting on their farm. And so he went to Washington, D.C. to ask the president for exemption from military service. When he arrived in Washington, he walked straight up to the doors of the White House and asked to speak directly with the president. A young official standing guard told him, you can't see the president. The president's far too busy to see you. Get back out there and fight like you're supposed to. So the young soldier left the White House, not knowing how he would break the bad news to his family. As he was sitting on a nearby park bench, a young boy came up to him and said, why are you so unhappy? What's wrong? The soldier looked at the boy and began to pour out his heart. He told the child that since his father and brother had been killed, he was the only man left in his family. He was desperately needed back at the farm and the only person who could make it possible was the president himself. The little boy said simply, come with me. Taking him by the hand, the boy led the soldier back around to the White House. They walked through the back door, past the guards, past the generals, past the high-ranking government officials until they got to the president's office. The little boy didn't even knock on the door. He just opened it and walked in. There, standing behind the desk, studying battle plans with the Secretary of State was President Abraham Lincoln. The president looked up and said, Oh, what can I do for you, Tad? The little boy replied, Dad, this man needs to talk to you. Our father. He's inviting us to share in the relationship he has with the Father. Not only do we pray to the Father through Jesus, but we pray by the Holy Spirit. In Romans 8.26, Paul says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us. Sometimes people say, I wouldn't know where to begin. I, I wouldn't know how to pray. But when you invite Jesus into your life, he comes in by his Spirit. He lives within you. And when you pray, his spirit helps you to pray, to communicate with God. And there are rewards to prayer. Jesus said, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your father who's unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So what are the rewards of prayer? Well, one of them is peace. Now, in a world where life is so busy, there are so many things that can cause us to worry, isn't there? Things like relationships, job, family, health, and you know, the small things too. And I heard of a mother who texts her grown-up daughter saying, start worrying, details to follow. You know, it's really easy, isn't it, to go through life like that and move from worry to worry? Yeah, St. Paul says in his letter to the Philippians, he says, don't worry about anything. And instead, in everything, by prayer and petition, let your requests be known to God. In other words, when you're worried, pray about it. And he says the results will be amazing. He says the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Yeah, but peace doesn't actually mean that there are gonna be no troubles, problems, or hard work. It kind of means being in the midst of all those things, but still having this calmness in your heart. It's a bit like the deep ocean current. And even though there are waves on the surface, there's still a real stillness underneath and that's what God gives you as you come to him in prayer. And another reward of prayer is perspective. You know in the busyness of life it's not easy to make time to pray. It can feel actually like a bit of a waste of time but in my experience when I do take the time to pray and in particular thank God the worries of life just don't seem so big anymore. The things that I'm dealing with in my life are still the same things, but through prayer, my perspective on them changes and I can face them head on. But prayer doesn't just change us, it changes situations. This is the power of prayer. Bueno, una, un día como cualquier otro, nos estamos en la mina y, y en ese día yo no tenía trabajo al tiro inmediatamente. Así que me llevé el equipo al taller y ahí hice mi trabajo y luego me fui al refugio. Entonces, al, eh, yo estaba, cuando esto ocurrió, una, esta explosión, eh, sobre nuestras cabezas a la, cerca de las 2 de la tarde, y nos deja tapados por cuatro horas, eh, con tierra, con polvo, eh, y de ahí luego discurrimos poder salir de ese lugar, de alguna manera de escapar, y realmente nos dimos cuenta que no había escapatoria de ese lugar. Dijimos la única posibilidad, se llama Dios, se llama Cristo, 
así que vamos a tener que orar aquí. Así que se, se hace esta reunión y se reparten tareas. Y bueno, dentro de esas tareas, eh, bueno, aparte también de, de ver cuántos alimentos teníamos, prácticamente no teníamos alimentos más de dos o tres días eh, como porciones normales. Pero entre todas esas tareas, a mí me, me, me dice, bueno, que sabemos que usted es cristiano, creemos que usted nos guía en la oración. La primera oración fue más o menos, más o menos así. Le dijimos, Señor, no somos los mejores hombres. Eh, Señor, ten misericordia de nosotros. Eh, mira a los jóvenes, mira a nuestra familia. Eh, en fin, eh, le presentamos toda eh, nuestra situación al Señor. Así que nosotros acá no podemos hacer nada, solamente nos queda usted, porque no tenemos a otro quien clamar, sino que sabemos que usted es el que escucha la oración. ¿Mm? Empezaron a pasar los días y ya empezamos a tener una oración a las 12 del día. Y esto empezó a causar eh, cambios ¿eh? en las personas, eh, ánimo, en el ánimo, en la amistad, en la unidad. El Espíritu de Dios estaba ahí con nosotros. Eh, yo no he visto hombres más humillados que los 33. Estuvimos haciendo ayunos de 24 horas, de 48 horas, 72 horas, fue lo que más aguantamos para poder que estos alimentos nos duraran en, en esas porciones de tan pequeñas, pero para nosotros era importante. Así que duramos hasta el día 16, se nos acaban los alimentos después nosotros. Cuando al día 17 el Señor permite que nos encuentren, así que ya nos empezamos a dar cuenta que había movimiento de maquinaria y, y que nos estaban tratando de buscar en diferentes lugares. Pero después de 17 días de praying, un miracle. A probe had found its human target. And then a simple note, proof they were all alive. Y estábamos ahí, eh, bueno, orando todos los días, eh, pidiéndole a Dios que él se lo guiara y que realmente eh, no encontrara. 65 days after the collapse. And after 33 days of drilling, Eagle's Plan B reaches the miners. Mencionar también que eh, 22 de ellos aceptaron a Cristo. Eso es algo bastante importante, creo yo. Cuando estábamos por salir, ahí se producen. Eh, eh, tuve que llamarlos a la oración, tuve que recordarles que y nadie me sale de aquí hasta que no le demos las gracias al Señor. The last miner has lifted to the surface. This is the moment. This rescue has come to an end. An explosion of celebration and joy after more than two months trapped more than 2,000 feet underground. All 33 have been rescued. You can't prove the existence of God by answers to prayer. But I've found that stuff happens when I pray. It can be easy to dismiss answers to prayer as coincidence. But as William Temple, the former Archbishop of Canterbury said, when I pray, coincidences happen. And when I don't, they don't. I sometimes find it helpful to use a prayer diary or to write down my prayers. What I actually do now is to write them down in the Bible. So I use this Bible in one year and I uh, write down the prayers each year and then when I come back to read that same passage I can see the prayers that I've written down and I can tick the ones that have been answered and I can reflect on those that are not. But prayer isn't like a kind of slot machine where you put in your prayer and you get the answer exactly when and how you want it. Prayer's about a relationship with God. A simple way to describe it is it's kind of like traffic lights. Sometimes you ask for something and you get a green light. You receive what you've been asking for, sometimes immediately. Sometimes it's a red light and that means no. And I know for me there have been times when the answer has been no. And when I look back, I am so thankful that God shut that door. Because, for example, if he hadn't, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. He knew what was best for me. But there are times when it's not at all clear why the answer is no. And we may never understand the reason why. And that can be really 
hard. I think of an occasion some years ago when I was playing squash with my, one of my very best friends, Mick Hawkins. He just played a beautiful backhand drive and as he turned to play the forehand, he just dropped dead of a heart attack. And I have never cried out to God more than I did in that moment. He has six children, the youngest was six and the oldest was 18. And we had to tell each of these children it was the most painful thing. And it, it still is today the most painful thing for me. At five o'clock the following morning, I went out for a walk because obviously I couldn't sleep and I was praying, I crying out to God saying, God, I don't understand why this has happened. But I'm not gonna stop trusting in you. I'm not gonna give up praying. Corrie Ten Boom said, when a train goes through a tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off. You sit still and trust the driver. Other times, it's like a yellow light. Wait. You pray for something and you don't receive what you've been asking for immediately and you have to wait and trust. If a five-year-old asked to drive a car, you'd say no. But you don't mean never drive a car. You mean wait until you're old enough. Just because something isn't happening for you right now doesn't mean it won't happen. God's timing is perfect. I pray anytime, anywhere. I don't bow down on my knees and pray, but I do hope for stuff, and I think that's the same as praying. I pray when I want to talk to him, um, when I feel like I need guidance. Every journal entry I write is titled like Dear God, which is kind of weird, oh, really? but it is. And this is the book of prayers that I always have it on me. I'm giving thanks, mostly. When you pray with your family at meals, it's like, I don't know. I think I would prefer for it to be silent, a little quiet. It's like talking to anybody. You just, but you're talking to God. Be praying in my head, or sometimes just saying it out loud. I just sort of put the thoughts out there, put that idea out there, and then I go about my business hoping that things will just come together. I just chat to him like I'm chatting, chatting to you right now. I'd say that there are three kind of um, tips when it comes to prayer. To keep it simple, to keep it honest, and to keep it going. Um, to keep it simple means that uh, you have to make your prayer as simple as possible. Um, reduce it even just to one sentence. Um, can be sometimes five minutes, can be 10 minutes, can be half an hour. Then keep it honest. Um, we often think that we have to be uh, in a certain mood to pray. So that before starting praying, we have to be peaceful, we have to be joyful, or we have to be enthusiastic about the Lord. The reality is that the, most of the time, uh, we are in completely different mood. Um, so we are either um, worried, or we are uh, tired, or we are frustrated about something, or we are angry about something. The secret is really to realize that each one of these feelings, even the most negative one, I'd say even anger, even lust, can become a fuel to prayer, can be transformed into prayer. When I start praying, I, I just focus on what is the dominant feeling in my heart. Uh, if it is a positive feeling, like joy, I offer this joy to the Lord. If it is a negative feeling, like um, frustration or tiredness, I start from there and I say to the Lord, Lord, I'm tired or I'm frustrated, um, and I, I kind of express all the reasons of my frustrations to the, uh, frustration to the Lord, and I, and I transform them into prayer in this way, and then keep it going. We can pray all the time. I can pray uh, for the people around me. I can just um, say to the Lord very simply, uh, Lord, I love you, or Lord, help me. I can, um, in any situation, um, when I am in a church, when I am in my room, before going to bed, um, before meals, yes, but also when I'm walking, when I'm driving, um, often I realize I'm praying even without having decided to pray, um, just because it has become a kind of habit. So keep it simple, uh, keep it honest, keep it going. Over the course of my Christian life, I've prayed in lots of different ways, and sometimes it's really useful to have a guide to help you to remember what to pray for. And some people use the prayer that Jesus taught, the Lord's Prayer, as a model. 
Something I found really helpful a friend once told me was just remember three words, thank you, sorry and please. So thank you means trying to cultivate a kind of attitude of gratitude. Um, praising God for who he is, thanking him for all that he's given. So I try and count my blessings before I count my problems. And it's also really important to say sorry as well. Um, I once heard of this prayer which was, so far today God, I've done all right. I haven't gossiped or lost my temper. I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish or overindulgent and I'm glad about that. But in a few minutes God, I'm gonna have to get out of bed and from then on I'm gonna need a lot more help. I always find that there's plenty of things to confess. The question often arises, well, why do we need to confess our sins at all? I mean, Jesus died on the cross for us. Surely he's forgiven us everything. You know, why did Jesus need to say, forgive us our sins when we're forgiven already? Well, Jesus gave us this visual aid. Mm, the night before Jesus was crucified, he was having dinner with his disciples. And afterwards, he took a towel and started washing the disciples' feet. But when he came to wash Peter's feet, Peter said, no, no, Lord, don't wash my feet. And Jesus said, unless I wash your feet, you have no part of me. So Peter says, in effect, well, in that case, why don't you wash my whole body? And Jesus says, no, 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 you don't need to have your whole body washed. A person who's had a bath doesn't need another bath. All you need is to have your feet washed. So when Jesus comes into your life and you receive total forgiveness, it's like your whole body is washed. And you don't need to have another bath. You don't need to start all over again every time you mess up. But as we go through life, it's like we pick up bits of dirt on the way. And daily, we need to receive forgiveness. And lastly, it's good to say, please, Jesus taught his disciples to pray, give us today our daily bread. So pray for others and pray for ourselves. And anything that's bothering you is big enough to ask God for, and you can pray anytime, any place. And there are times when it's great to pray on your own, and other times it's really good to pray with others. I can remember the very first time I prayed with someone else. It was with two of our closest friends, Nikki and Silla Lee. I, I'd been a Christian for about two or three weeks, and I was on holiday with them, and I think it was Scylla who suggested, let's try praying together. So we prayed probably for about two minutes with quite long pauses and gaps in those two minutes. At the end of it, my shirt was ringing wet with sweat. I'd been so nervous just praying out loud for the first time. But it was a wonderful experience. Over the years, I found that praying is amazing. And I've seen God answer so many prayers and it's really helped in my relationship with God. And you can start today. In fact, you can start right now. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are our Heavenly Father, that you love me and you want me to get to know you better as I pray. Help me to pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.